This is the Cirrus SR22G7, and it has an engine problem. It was bound to have an engine problem, and there is a reason why. So, the SR22G7 is often described as one of the most advanced single-engine piston aircraft on the market, boasting a carbon fiber-rich construction, a comfortable and modern interior, sophisticated avionics with synthetic vision, and the well-known Cirrus airframe parachute system. Despite these impressive features, it relies on a power plant whose core design dates back decades, the Continental IO550 series engine. This juxtaposition of futuristic airframe technology paired with a legacy engine design has fueled debate within the general aviation community. Many observers wonder why Cirrus has not opted for a high-tech diesel or an automotive-derived engine with at least a full-authority digital engine control system. The answer emerges from a broader context that includes engineering constraints, certification hurdles, market preferences, and a long tradition of cautious progression in aviation. Cirrus introduced the G7 update with new avionics, refined aerodynamics, and an upgraded interior. That alone was enough to capture the attention of owners and prospective buyers. Yet when it came to the actual power plant, it remained an air-cooled, horizontally opposed, six-cylinder Continental engine. The particular model, the IO550N variant, generates approximately 310 horsepower, give or take. Cirrus and Continental have layered incremental improvements onto this engine over the years, such as refined induction systems, more comprehensive engine monitoring, and flexible operating procedures. Yet the question persists. Why rely on an engine family that has roots stretching back for decades when overhead cams, liquid cooling, and advanced electronic engine management could, in principle, reduce pilot workload and boost overall efficiency? The issue frequently boils down to reliability and predictability, two concepts that weigh heavily in aviation, because power plant failures in flight are more than mere mechanical inconveniences. They become critical safety events. The general aviation industry has a long history of grappling with new engine ideas that often end in limited adoption or outright failure. Many attempts at introducing fresh, clean sheet power plants have stumbled, not because the underlying technology was unworkable, but because manufacturers, operators, and individual owners preferred to stick with what was already proven. This pattern of market inertia reveals itself whenever an aviation entrepreneur tries to launch something radically new, whether that involves innovative materials, new engine cycles, or advanced control systems. It's not only about the engine's capabilities. It also involves an ecosystem built around mechanic training, stable parts availability, specialized tooling, and an acknowledged track record that can guide insurance underwriters and flight schools. Embracing an unproven engine can undermine all of that, requiring significant investment in new support infrastructure, specialized maintenance skills, and potentially complex warranty coverage. If that unproven engine experiences a wave of early failures, the financial and reputational fallout can be enormous. For Cirrus, sticking with the IO550 and the SR22 is less a refusal to innovate and more a practical calculation. The SR-22's mission is to fly comfortably at speeds that approach 200 knots, carry four to five people depending on load, and remain operable under a variety of atmospheric and runway conditions. The tried and true Continental engine, despite its older roots, delivers enough torque and horsepower to meet these demands reliably. When people describe the IO-550 as old technology, they tend to point out features like its reliance on air cooling via prominent cylinder fins. They mention the manual mixture control instead of an automatically managed system. They also note the use of push rods rather than overhead cams, which is less sophisticated than many automotive engines. Finally, they highlight that it still burns 100 low lead fuel, which has been under scrutiny for years because of its lead content. Yet those same features, while outdated on paper, have been proven in countless flight hours and are supported by a deep pool of mechanics, spare parts, and operating experience. Refinements such as improved engine monitoring have made it easier to track performance in real time, detect anomalies, and plan maintenance proactively. Cirrus has integrated the engine with the G1000 and Perspective Series avionics, enabling the pilot to see critical data in a clean, graphical format. 
Advocates of modernization often argue that the SR22 G7 should come standard with a diesel engine. Jet A is cheaper than 100 low lead in many parts of the globe, especially outside the United States, and a diesel cycle can yield better fuel efficiency in terms of brake-specific fuel consumption. However, practical realities challenge this theoretical appeal. Automotive-derived diesel blocks often weigh significantly more than their avgas counterparts, especially when they start life as cast-iron automotive engines designed to handle road conditions. That extra weight cuts into a general aviation airplane's useful load, forcing manufacturers to recertify the aircraft at a higher gross weight or reduce other mission-critical parameters like passenger count or baggage capacity. The Diamond DA-42 is an example where a switch from the lighter Thielert diesel to the heavier Austro engine diesel added weight but improved reliability. Some operators accepted that trade-off, but others balk at it because every extra pound has to come from somewhere, and re-engineering an airframe to handle that weight is neither trivial nor cheap. The diesel revolution in GA also encountered issues with gearboxes, cold starts, and complex electronic control systems. Many of these engines rely on high-pressure common rail injection, turbocharging, and gear reduction, which can be wonderful for fuel efficiency, but introduce new points of failure and specialized maintenance requirements. Early adopters often found themselves dealing with reliability issues, limited parts availability, and uncertain warranty support. These teething problems contributed to a degree of skepticism that is difficult to overcome. The Thielert saga exemplifies this. That company adapted a Mercedes automotive core engine for aviation and for a while seemed poised to change the landscape. But then it went bankrupt, leaving Diamond Aircraft scrambling to support owners. The fiasco showed that even a seemingly robust automotive engine could run into hurdles when tasked with extended, high-power operation in the flight environment, along with the inevitable complexities of aircraft certification and post-sale support. Part of the push for modernization in GA revolves around the concept of full authority digital engine control, often shortened to FADEC. In principle, FADEC eliminates the need for the pilot to manage mixture and propeller settings manually. Instead, a computer calculates and adjusts air-fuel ratio and ignition timing to maintain optimal performance and efficiency from takeoff to landing. Although some Continental and Lycoming models have experimented with versions of FADEC, widespread adoption has been slower than many anticipated. Certification of a fully digital control system can be more complex and expensive, and owners or operators sometimes worry about single points of electronic failure, despite it being dual redundant. In older magneto-based systems, a magneto failure can be identified and resolved by standard troubleshooting steps or repairs that many mechanics know. With a complex FADEC module, a failure may require specific software tools, specialized parts, and a deeper knowledge base that isn't always available in every maintenance facility. That fear, whether fully justified or not, causes hesitation. Over the years, bold attempts at bringing advanced engines into GA have arisen and faded. Porsche worked with Mooney in the 1980s to create a high-tech boxer engine with overhead cams, electronic ignition, fan cooling, and simplified power controls. At first glance, it seemed like a sure win, an aviation engine with a Porsche badge. Yet a combination of teething pains, uneven support, and inadequate follow-through led to frustrated owners, lawsuits, and an eventual withdrawal from the marketplace. Toyota managed to certify a Lexus-based V8 in the mid-1990s, but never took it into mass production. Honda tried a similar approach with the so-called HAP engine in conjunction with Continental, only to abandon it before it gained significant traction. Liability concerns, low production volumes, and the inherently conservative nature of aviation all contributed to the demise of these projects. Large automakers realized that building car engines by the hundreds of thousands is a different prospect from manufacturing a few hundred aviation engines per year under a certification regime that can easily magnify any design flaw into a major liability event. With these lessons in mind, Cirrus and other general aviation manufacturers often prefer incremental refinement of established engines rather than leaps toward untested technology. The IO550 might not be revolutionary, 
but it has been improved in small but meaningful ways, including better vibration management through refined engine mounts, advanced engine sensors that feed into digital avionics, and small design tweaks that have gradually enhanced reliability. Meanwhile, the airplane around it has embraced many cutting-edge features. In the G7, pilots can enjoy touchscreens with detailed engine data, autopilot envelope protection, real-time traffic and weather overlays, and synthetic vision that creates a 3D picture of terrain and obstacles ahead. In many ways, the SR-22 has become an advanced airborne computer that happens to be powered by an engine design that was perfected in a different era. This mix of new and old might seem odd, but it has proven effective enough to make the SR-22 one of the most popular GA aircraft in the high-performance single category. Some dreamers predict a future where the SR-22 family or similar aircraft adopt small turboprops that burn Jet A, relying on a single power lever to handle everything through a sophisticated FADEC. While this concept is elegant, it often crashes into the wall of economics. Small turbines tend to have high initial acquisition costs and may not operate efficiently at the lower altitudes where many SR-22 flights occur. Turbine ownership also includes more expensive inspections and possible overhauls at hours-based intervals that might be more frequent than the equivalent piston TBO. Pilots who want a single-engine turboprop often look at the Pilatus PC-12 or Dahar TBM series, but those are substantially larger, more expensive aircraft that appeal to a different market segment. In a simpler vein, a thoroughly modern diesel engine that runs on Jet A would appear to be the next logical step, but even that path is complicated. Diamond Aircraft succeeded with the Austro engine, an adaptation of a Mercedes diesel, but not without navigating severe financial turbulence when Thielert went bankrupt. The heavy cast iron block that Austro uses underscores that there is no free lunch in aviation engine design. It can deliver reliability and fuel efficiency, but at the cost of increased weight. Diamond could adjust the entire airframe to accommodate that weight because it had full control over both airplane and engine design. Cirrus would face a similarly enormous investment and recertification effort if it intended to install a heavier diesel in the SR-22. That prospect, measured against uncertain returns, might not be appealing unless the market strongly signals that it wants and will pay for such an overhaul. Whenever people accuse Cirrus of clinging to a dinosaur engine, owners and flight schools commonly push back. They emphasize that widely available parts, established maintenance procedures, and a known safety record are not trivial conveniences. The heart of the conversation revolves around balancing ambition with caution. Cirrus forged ahead with composite structures, glass cockpits, and a ballistic chute when those were relatively novel in GA, so it is not as though the company is averse to innovation. Rather, it operates in a tight economic environment where each engineering change entails serious liability and certification costs. The average buyer, especially one who wants a personal traveling machine rather than an experimental platform, might decide that a proven engine is a better bet than a brand new concept that could face unknown maintenance or reliability wrinkles. In many ways, the continuing presence of the IO550 in the SR-22 G7 reflects how aviation often evolves, cautiously and with a bias toward what has been proven in the field. It prompts a question about whether the engine is truly a problem for Cirrus. If a problem is defined as a threat to safety, dispatch reliability, or performance adequacy, then it's hard to say the IO550 fails. The engine powers thousands of flights every year, enabling owners to travel comfortably at near turboprop speeds with a reliability record that is well understood. The biggest knocks against it, apart from lacking overhead cams and being air-cooled, center on the fact that it still uses leaded fuel, and it requires a certain technique to manage mixture, especially during hot starts or high-altitude climbs. Those are real issues, but not necessarily showstoppers for many owners. Of course, improvements are always on the horizon. The phase-out of 100 low lead is inching forward, and new forms of unleaded avgas or even alternative fuels could change the landscape. A more widespread adoption of FADEC might become viable if it's packaged in a way that reduces pilot workload and lowers maintenance costs without raising them elsewhere. 
It's not inconceivable that Cirrus or another major player might devote the resources needed to certify an entirely new power plant that either sips Jet A or unleaded Avgas, is water-cooled for more precise temperature control, and is paired with state-of-the-art digital controls. Whether that happens sooner rather than later will depend on regulatory alignment, the willingness of the market to pay for it, and an appetite for risk among investors and the manufacturers. In the end, calling the engine in the Cirrus SR22 G7 old can be accurate from an engineering perspective, but it may not fully capture the practical reasons for its enduring presence. It is an engine built on decades of data, well-understood failure modes, established inspection protocols, and a broad network of support. Pair that with the advanced avionics and safety features that Cirrus has spent years perfecting, and it remains a formula that sells. This reality may disappoint aviation enthusiasts who dream of overhead cams, liquid-cooled cylinders, or a single power lever controlling everything through a digital interface. Nonetheless, it is the reality that keeps airplanes in the sky and keeps flight schools, mechanics, and owners aligned on a platform they can collectively trust. That is the essence of why the SR-22 G7 retains its so-called old engine. It is less about a lack of imagination and more about the hard-won lessons of aviation, where any radical shift must be balanced against safety, practicality, and proven performance. There is no fiction in observing that within this airplane's sleek composite body, tradition and innovation coexist in a carefully negotiated truce that is unlikely to break, unless or until the entire market and regulatory environment shift decisively toward a different kind of propulsion.